that uh, we have the opportunity of uh, conversing with uh, Abdul Abdullah at this moment. Uh, so I would invite you uh, to uh, present uh, any questions that you may have uh, for this uh, rather unique op opportunity here in, in Canada and Quebec. Uh, so I, if you have any questions, uh, please go ahead. If you'd like any elaborations, please ask. Uh, but I think it's rather obvious uh, that uh, we have uh, an accurate representation of what the current political context is and the prospects uh, for a, a true uh, peaceful uh, resolution of this conflict, which has been held by the Palestine Liberation Organization since its inception uh, in 1964, mm. in which uh, the uh, um, eventual uh, solution to the, uh, the Zionist nation-state uh, uh, structure, superstructure, is the uh, program of, that was presented by the PLO at the time, which was calling for a democratic, secular Palestine. And uh, since that time, in the course of geopolitical negotiations, of course, we have been presented with the, uh, the Oslo uh, principles of 1993. And uh, it has uh, become evident as well that uh, this agreement, all those signed by the Zionist administration of the state, has not been implemented. In fact, now we have seen the quasi-annexation of the entire Jordan River Valley and the prospect of the annexation of Sector C, which is 62% of the West Bank. So, uh, when um, the Zionist state has made concessions, it has been under duress. For instance, when it withdrew from Gaza, where there were uh, a number of uh, Zionist colonies uh, that uh, amounted to a rather minimal number of, uh, of uh, settlers, so-called, who are actually the uh, colonialists. And uh, it required uh, some 5,000, the presence of 5,000 troops there in order to uh, uh, guarantee their, uh, their continued you know, um, uh, presence on the, on the land there because of the concentration of the population of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, 80% of whom are refugees from uh, 48 uh, the Zionist State of Israel. Abdullah Abdullah's uh, presentation and uh, my presentation is being recorded and will be uh, uploaded to YouTube so it can be used as a resource uh, at, on other occasions because this opportunity is, is rather rare, actually. Um, let me check to see that I'm recording this properly. Okay. Now, uh, in terms of uh, my own background and qualifications, uh, uh, in order to do my doctoral studies, I came from Ontario, from Toronto, here to Montreal, to uh, uh, continue my doctoral studies at the uh, University of Quebec in Montreal. Learned French in order to do my doctoral thesis. Because uh, no other political science department in a Canadian university would allow me to do a doctoral thesis, even though I was qualified to do so. I uh, started doing my uh, university studies in, uh, in a Bachelor of Science in Physics, actually, at the University of Waterloo. But because of Palestine, I found it necessary to uh, drop the uh, scientific studies and uh, went into the graduate school in political science in order to pursue uh, um, the study of uh, political theory, political philosophy, and uh, uh, the uh, methodology required to do a, a proper critique of, uh, of the Zionist ideology, uh, which uh, I have now, now done, uh, now accomplished. And uh, my, my doctoral thesis, which is uh, published uh, there, actually, 
does a critique of Zionism, not from a historical point of view, because that's been done. The, uh, the new historians, you know, specifically the most uh, principled of which is uh, Professor uh, Ilan Pape at Exeter University in England, has done an excellent, you know, breakdown of what happened in 48 and, and uh, the, uh, the plan, Dalit, uh, of the Zionist militias at that time to expel the population of Palestinians to the greatest extent possible to achieve the occupation of the greatest uh, amount of territory possible. So even though the UN Resolution 181 was, uh, was the uh, legal justification for the establishment of the Zionist state, Nonetheless, we find that the uh, end result of the war of 1947 to 48, actually, because the Zionist war against the Palestinian people started before the recognition of the uh, state of uh, Israel by the United Nations, and the expulsion of the Palestinians began before the UN actually took up uh, and supported the resolution for the recognition of the Zionist state. And uh, the amount of territory that was allocated under Resolution 181 was about a third of the territory of Palestine. And uh, during the War of 47-48, the Zionist militias took control over two-thirds of the territory of Palestine. So, while the uh, Zionist state claims Resolution 181 as justification for its legitimate existence and recognition internationally in the geopolitical system, actually, uh, Resolution 181 is a denial of the legitimacy of the present-day Zionist state because it uh, ex exemplifies the fact that the Zionist militias disregarded the resolution and the frontier that was established by the Partition Resolution, so-called, and went beyond that uh, frontier to establish the 1948 State of Israel, which was later recognized by the United States of America within uh, the same day. Actually, Russia beat uh, the United States to the recognition of the Zionist State of Israel because the Communist parties throughout the world were pro-Zionist at the time and actually supplied not only diplomatic and propaganda support through the various communist parties, but actually supply, supplied the arms from Czechoslovakia so that the Zionist militias were able to fight and uh, win that uh, particular war against the Palestinians. Now, in terms of uh, the, uh, the work that I've been able to done, do, so uh, rather than going into the historical aspects, uh, and uh, rather than going into the uh, Judaic critique of Zionism, which is done as well by various individuals like Menuhin's uh, uh, father, and uh, even some conservative, you know, right-wing uh, critiques uh, of Zionism, like the book Perfidy, which uh, critiques, you know, the Zionist militias as well. Uh, there is a modern-day uh, critique of uh, Judaic critique of Zionism from Professor Yaakov Rapkin, who teaches at the University of Waterloo, uh, uh, excuse me, University, uh, Université de Montréal, uh, here. In, and uh, so, those areas have been taken care of. What I have done is an elaborate critique of Zionist ideology in political philosophy, going back to the origins of the nation-state concept which has been used by the Zionist ideologues to establish a state uh, along the lines of, uh, of, uh, of European you know, political uh, uh, philosophy 200 years later, totally out of context, in a completely different uh, part of the world which has had a history um, which is very much older than that of Europe. You know, in Europe, the nation-state concept could be floated, you know, for a while, because Europe was colonized uh, only uh, after uh, the long period in which, you know, the Middle East was, so, you know, was, uh, you know, peopled, you know, by the migrant, the human migration patterns coming out of uh, Africa. So in the Middle East, we have, you know, cities established, you know, 7,000 years ago, some of the first cities in the world, in uh, in Jericho, in uh, in uh, 
Salome, uh, which was you know, the predecessor of a city now called Nablus, or in Hebrew it's called Shem, which is the Israelis now use. When I actually went to Tel Aviv to visit uh, my cousin who was uh, visiting her parents who still live there, and uh, people would ask me, where am I living? And I would say in Nablus. And the Israelis did not know the name Nablus for that city, that Palestinian city which is one of the major cities you know, in the West Bank. They call it Shem, from the biblical, you know, Hebraic name. Incredible, you know, like, difference, you know, in mentalities between the Israelis, well-meaning Israelis as well, who just do not know anything about the Palestinians. And in fact, in the entrance to the Palestinian cities, there's these huge red, you know, uh, signs there, which proclaim, in three languages, that it is illegal for Israelis to enter into a Palestinian city under Israeli law, and they're subject to two years imprisonment if an Israeli goes into a Palestinian city. <laughs> That's how much you know apartheid has been established there. It's it's ingrained in the very law. Okay, so I have a formal presentation, which is going to be the introduction to a new book of mine, dealing with the transitional process of how, with the eventual recognition of the Palestine state, which I think is coming up in the Security Council in November after the American election and the French resolution is going to be presented to the Security Council calling for the recognition of the state of Palestine, which has already been adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations, but the Security Council seems to have uh, more authority and geopolitical ma machinations. So this is a crucial vote and this time the United States uh, State Department is probably not going to veto the resolution. So Palestine is going to be recognized as an independent state in the short term uh, after the American election and before Obama hands over you know, presidential authority to the winner of that election in January. So there's November, December, January, anything can happen. And it is expected that the United States is not going to veto uh, that resolution. So, how do we proceed from that point forward? This is what I am beginning to address now, and uh, the introduction I have here is going to form the introduction to an introductory preface to uh, this new book in which I'm writing about the transitional process. Okay, first of all, I'd like to express my respects to the DSTT Culture Committee here in Montreal, which stands for Diversity, Social Solidarity, Tolerance and Transparency, and uh, its uh, organizer, Tarek Taha, with whom I'm working here in Montreal. Um, I would welcome you to the session of the World Social Forum 2016. The forum is one with which I identify because of the momentum that is created on an international dimension that works to become a world constituent assembly that will supersede the existing nation states and its so-called United Nations. While there are now 104, 194 recognized nations in the General Assembly, with Palestine being the 194th, it should be known that there are actually about 3,000 nations throughout the world in sociological terms. So in the actuality uh, of uh, social existence in the world, the United Nations does not represent the people of the world. It represents the nation states, the geopolitical system, and ignores all those nations that have not been able to achieve their independence, and ignores all the nations that are confined within existing nation states and that do not have the recognition of a nation. And uh, we can think of many such nations, uh, including the Quebecois nation, the Kurdish nation, etc., etc. So, to break out of the bonds of the geopolitical world, we need to go to the civil society of each nation and to unite our civil societies as we are doing here at the Forum. My own origin is that of a refugee kid from a Jewish family that had lived in Poland, both Warsaw and the city of Lublin. You should know that while the Zionist parties have used the Nazi Holocaust to justify a colonial project of occupation and not expulsion, it was actually in the USSR Soviet Union that the most Jewish people fled to in order to escape from the Nazis. So about 500,000 escaped to Russia, while the Zionists made deals with the Nazi regime to get 60,000 
of their own party members out of Germany and only 1,843 out of Hungary. And yet, the Zionist mentality continues to claim its superior position as a refuge of the Jewish people, even while they did so little to actually save the Jewish people during the Nazi occupation of Poland and the other regions there. Now, the great thing about being a second generation survivor was that my mother was from Warsaw and she was a Jewish Bundist. Now, you probably don't know what the Jewish Bund was because not only is the history of the Jewish Bund suppressed by the, uh, the forces that uh, the political, political science uh, departments that failed to recognize uh, the existence of the Jewish people before the establishment of the state of Israel, because before that the Jewish nation was not supposed to exist. Therefore, it's you know wiped out of you know like historical analysis. But the Jewish Bund and what it stood for was also suppressed by the Zionist educational system, which took over all of the uh, Jewish educational institutions throughout uh, North America, South America. For instance, um, I went to a Jewish Heger, as it's called in Yiddish. In fact, English is not even my first language, and my first language is Yiddish, which is a, German, a Jewish dialect of German from the Middle Ages. And it's not, it doesn't resemble Hebrew at all. Now, so I'm going to explain to you what the uh, Jewish Bundist uh, philosophy is because it is the uh, fundamental critique of Zionism. That you may not know that the Jewish socialist movement was more popular than the Zionists amongst the Jewish community of Eastern Europe is essential to understanding the difference between Zionism and the Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish people, basically. As a result, I was raised in the Jewish and anti-Zionist and anti -Zionist at the same time. I did not have to torture myself to escape from a Zionist upbringing, since I was allowed to know that you don't have to be a Zionist to be Jewish. The culture as religion was assumed as a given, and although we did not care to consider the validity of the theocratic religious matters after the Holocaust, the congregation each Saturday morning was the key to life. In addition to the public Protestant English school in Toronto, I also studied at the Jewish Talmud Torah in the evenings. Talmud Torah means the study of the Torah. The educational methodology in the Torah study sessions was to read through all of the Hebrew version and translate it into English. One sentence after another over seven years, together with the other books like the Talmud, the Gemara, the Mishnah. It's a very elaborate, you know, culture. However, and the great consequence was that I actually knew what was written in the Torah and so knew that the Zionist pretensions were false as to their claims in Judaism for the establishment of this Zionist state. Aside from the matter of whether the deity is a valid concept of not or not, we can nonetheless delve into that historical text to find out what was intended in the first place, rather than what the Torah has been manipulated to be believed. For example, while it is not mentioned, it is evident that the historical figures, who were called prophets by uh, named, you know, uh, Noah and Abraham, were historical figures that preceded the existence of the Jewish people or nation, and it may be, as it, as it may be called, as such, the covenant with Abraham was not a covenant with the Jewish people alone. You know, this is evident if you just consider, you know, the basic facts that Abraham existed 500 years before the establishment of the Jewish people. So right then and there, you know, you have a completely different perspective than what is presented, you know, by the Zionist ideology. In the text, as it is actually written, even in the re revised Ezra version, that the covenant for the land of Canaan, for guarantee of residence and co-residence with the existing nations there, which were seven, there were seven nations coexisting in the Canaan territory there of what is now called the Holy Land, was for all the descendants of Abraham forever. Hmm? And the word forever is exact. It is the actual word used in Hebrew in the Torah. And the word descendants 
descendants of Abraham, is also translated as the seed of Abraham or the sons of Abraham. The latter. The matter of violence. I was in uh, uh, in Nablus uh, over the last uh, period of time. I was in, living in Nablus together with Palestinians for five months during this last winter. And when I arrived, I found that the, um, the uh, community center that I helped to establish a computer room for in 2011, when I was there previously, making public access computers there available for free to the internet for Palestinians in Nablus, had been raided by the military. And the soldiers went into the center in the middle of the night and took out all the hard drives from all the computers stole a laptop, stole uh, all the Wi-Fi keys, and stole the, um, um, uh, a memory stick of one thirty. So I started working on uh, rebuilding the computers. And the service that had been initiating, uh, initiated there at the, uh, at the uh, community center, which was broadcasting by internet radio, Palestine News, you know, on a bi-weekly basis. And this uh, radio program started to become very popular, and the, and the Zionist you know, uh, apparatus became aware of it. And uh, in the uh, first few months, uh, there was like more than a million people who had listened to the radio broadcast because they were getting news direct from the source that was not censored and not filtered. And so all this was shut down. So I was rebuilding the computers, and then with the camera, you know, I went out to all the various demonstrations and filmed them in order to document them and put them up on my YouTube channel and established a, a YouTube uh, channel for the uh, Tanweer Center as well to continue this uh, medium. So I was at the Land Day demonstration, which is March 30th. And there, a peaceful demonstration, mostly with you know an older generation of people holding banners and flags. There was uh, no large uh, numbers of youth you know, who were there you know, just to throw stones or anything like that. No stones were thrown, not even one stone. And this uh, Zionist army was there to stop the demonstration from marching down the highway to a village. But you know, everybody just walked around the soldiers and went right through you know, the jeeps and everything like that, you know, and even put Palestinian flags into the jeeps' grills you know, as a sort of a insubordination, you know, a sign of uh, uh, def defiance. And then the military came and redoubled its numbers and went on top of the hill and set up a barrier that was impenetrable. And uh, people still kept on marching towards this obstruction. So that's when they started shooting tear gas canisters, okay? About big, like this, sp spitting out gas from both sides, you know? That's the model that they use. So there was, you know, one canister that was on the middle of the road in front of me. You know, people had retreated, you know, but silly me, you know, I stayed there, you know, in front of the military. I kept on filming, you know, as did a number of other people. So one young guy wanted to kick the canister away from himself, but he kicked it to the wrong side of the road. He, he should have kicked it to the side of the road, which was, you know, where there was an incline going down. And it would have fallen down, but instead he kicked it towards the upside, you know, of the hill, where I was standing, you know, in the uh, in the gutter, you know, uh, filming. So of course, you know, I kicked it back, and then the soldiers saw me, and I was fired upon, and I was hit by a, uh, a spherical bullet, right on the bone here, with the leg that I had kicked the canister, their sacred canister, and I was shot right here. And I didn't even notice anything at first, you know, because there's no nerves there. But then it started to swell, and, and the shock, it's a high-velocity projectile, uh, a metal sphere about so big, covered in plastic. And they call it a rubber bullet. It sounds very innocuous, you know. But this is a high-velocity projectile, and it causes damage, you know. If it hits a soft tissue, it will tear the tissue. If it hits an eye, it will destroy an eye. If it hits the skull, it will crack the skull and cause a, con a major concussion. So uh, these are, and they call it a non-lethal uh, um, method of crowd control. And it's now starting to be used by the police in North America even, you know, because it's 
classified as non-lethal. However, it is it can be lethal, and it is a very severe you know uh, can cause very severe you know uh, injury to a person. Uh, I was in shock and didn't realize that I was in shock, which is you know a symptom of shock. And I kept on working, went to another demonstration the next morning, went to a conference the next afternoon. And then the following morning, I thought I would climb up a ladder and ended up falling two meters down onto the uh, you know, uh, uh, stone floor. Ended up uh, injuring my back, which I'm still recovering from, and uh, uh, hitting my head, going unconscious, and, and, and getting, uh, requiring four stitches to stop the bleeding. All because of that. So, and they talk about violence. The first violence is inflicted upon the civilian Palestinians by the Zionist military. Okay. Uh, whether it's called uh, 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 crowd control or whatever, it's still violence. Then, when Palestinians attack, uh, you know, this is a war against the Palestinian people that is being conducted to the greatest extent possible, permitted, you know, by the opposition that they have to endure. So, but when Palestinians retaliate against the military personnel and spontaneously Palestinians, young Palestinians even, go out and try to attack, you know, an, uh, a Zionist soldier because a member of their family has recently been killed and Palestinians are shot with live bullets at demonstrations, nonviolent demonstrations even, on an almost daily basis and, and a Palestinian uh, with some uh, f familial connection uh, to a Palestinian who has been killed, goes out and tries to retaliate on their own in a spontaneous fashion without the encouragement you know, of the uh, political authority in Palestine that has been established from Oslo, they are called terrorists. Sometimes the spontaneous you know, retaliation from Palestinians is directed against civilians which is not to be desired, of course. But uh, the proper definition of terrorism is uh, the violence inflicted upon a civilian population with the aim of terrorizing them into submission. So this is the primary definition of how Palestinians are treated in the occupied territories. And when there are isolated incidents of Israelis being attacked, you know, who are civilians, who may be soldiers, who are off duty even, you know, nonetheless, this is what is, you know, makes it through the media and is called terrorism. So I would critique, you know, the, uh, the use of the term terrorism in that way and uh, point out that it's mainly being used for the purposes of manipulation and political control and not to uh, actually denounce it and try to prevent any further violence, but it's actually being used to perpetuate the existing violence. That's how that argument can be countered and should be countered. At the same time, the confusion between the terms Israeli and Israel should be taken uh, with more uh, uh, should be taken into consideration uh, to a greater extent by all concerned, because um, the only um, Israelis that the Palestinians get to meet in the occupied territories are the soldiers. The name used in Arabic for these soldiers is Yehudi, the Jews, because they're the only Jewish people that they ever meet, right? Because the Israeli Jews are not allowed to go into the Palestinian municipal uh, areas. Uh, they are not allowed to go into any um, uh, Israeli colonies, you know, in the West Bank. They're not allowed to go into 48 Israel. So they never meet any Jewish Israelis other than the soldiers. So the name for the soldiers is Yehudi. Now, this leads to a certain confusion because it leads to the uh, presumption that all the Jewish people support those soldiers, which is not the case, as I have already proven. So this problematic is, c'est uh, répandu in French, how do you say it in English? It spreads to uh, other uh, localities throughout the world so that even here in Montréal, there's confusion sometimes, you know, Jewish uh, the, um, uh, the anti-Zionist opposition groups here sometimes use the term Israeli to mean Israel, the state. 
because they use it as an adjective to describe the state, and they talk about the Israeli state. And then this leads people to think that they're talking about the Israelis. So it's an ambiguous formulation, which is not intended necessarily, but which leads to confusion and leaves them open to being charged with being anti-Jewish. So this should be avoided. Language of this ambiguous nature should be avoided. So when talking about um, uh, boycotting, even, you know, and this has been made explicit by the Palestinian BDS campaign, by the uh, uh, BDS uh, National Committee in Palestine, that the uh, BDS campaign is not directed against Israelis per se. It is directed against the state and its occupation. So it is the state that should be mentioned and not the people. First of all, because the Israeli public is composed of Palestinians, Druze, Bedouins, and Jewish people. Secondly, because not all Jewish Israelis support the Zionist state. And certainly only a minority of the Jewish Israelis ever go into the military. So all these reasons are reasons why we have to use very precise language and not uh, fall into ambiguous traps that are later used to attack us and nullify the critique that we make of Zionism. Yes? Yeah, well, I was just curious, uh, like beside uh, referring to Yehudi as uh, you know, a citizen of the state of Israel, what is the meaning of the term Yehudi? Yehudi? How do you define it? Uh, it's just Arabic for Jewish or Jew. But in English, the word Jew is an anti-Semitic term, actually. If you look in the 1933 Oxford Dictionary, the, the term Jew is defined in an anti-Semitic way, you know, uh, describing the various prejudices that the Christians have uh, at the time of the Jewish people. You know, it's an undesirable uh, denomination. You know, it is not something to be desired to be called a Jew. To be called a Jew is an insult. And in fact, the Nazis, when they forced uh, Jewish people to wear the uh, Jewish star on their clothing to be identified as being Jewish, the word put inside the star was uh, in German Yid, which means Jew. So it's the same, you know, that's confirmation of the fact that the term Jew is an anti-Semitic term. The term that should be used is Jewish. And in Arabic, Yehudi means both. It means both Jew and Jewish, you know. So it's, it leads to it's all sorts of confusion. A follower of Jewish Judaism. Yes, a follower Jewish of the Jewish uh, religion. As it should be understood. <clears throat> Very good question. Um, the uh, establishment of independent Palestine would necessarily take place within the existing geopolitical um, paradigm. And uh, what would be allowed to the Palestinians by the United Nations under a successful resolution of this nature would be a Palestinian nation state. It would be a state of the Palestinian people, of the Palestinian nation. So we are again still within, operating within the paradigm of the nation state, which is problematic. How to overcome that problem is that a Palestine state uh, would be relatively weak compared to the Zionist state, economically and politically, and would have to depend upon uh, alliances with the uh, surrounding um, Arab states, which would be giving it uh, aid, and so it would become part of the Arab League and a part of the Arab political culture, 
which goes beyond the nation-state formation. Secondly, a Palestine state would be obliged to um, set up uh, mechanisms of administration which would lead to a confederation with the state of Israel existing, which would lead to various concessions for the Palestinians by the Zionist state, which would lead to increasing um, uh, political weight to the Palestinian minority within Israel, and uh, would lead to further developments that would result in what is called a confederation between two states, sharing of water, sharing of airspace, sharing of uh, territory even, because there would have to be a resolution to the uh, Zionist colonies in the West Bank, which are built upon private Palestinian land, which are built upon uh, uh, Palestinian uh, territorial heritage lands, and uh, which uh, use electrical and uh, hydro resources in a disproportionate manner to uh, what is allocated to the Palestinians. So all of these uh, questions would have to be uh, uh, settled and would lead to mechanisms by which you know, there would have to be cooperation between the two states leading to a confederation in the first instance. One way of resolving the conflicts on a local individual level is that where there is a violation of historical rights, land rights in particular, it could be submitted to a tripartite commission. Okay. So let's say there's a, a Zionist colony on private Palestinian land. And the Palestinians will come forward with their title deeds that date from the Ottoman Empire, which precedes the establishment of the State of Israel, of course. And so, uh, how to resolve the ownership of that particular piece of land? Hmm. The way to resolve it would be that the Palestinians would nominate a judge. The Israelis would nominate an Israeli judge. And these two judges would choose a third judge that is agreeable to the first two judges. And they would form a tribunal, a tripartite tribunal, it's called. The Palestinians would come forward with their documentation, proving precedence. And the judges have to make a decision based upon legal precedent, on law. Thank you. Thank you very much for your participation. And so the judges would have to decide in favor of the Palestinian title deed, because it is historically a precedent. So right then and there, private lands would then become uh, returned you know, to the rightful owners. Now, it is up to the rightful owner, the Palestinian, to decide whether or not they wanted uh, to uh, live on the land themselves, farm on the land themselves, make use of the land themselves, and demand the expulsion of the Zionist colonists, or whether or not they will demand rent, and back rent as well. It's up to the Palestinian to decide what to be done with their private land, and it remains as a private position because they have a title deed. And the judges would be obliged to uh, come to a consensus decision for it to be an effective, you know, uh, binding uh, legal decision that would uh, overcome any uh, possible power objections. The judiciary would take control over the political process. And uh, because, you know, in the political theory, the judiciary is part of civil society and not the state. So the judiciary, like a Supreme Court, can decide that a law is unconstitutional. It has more power than a government, and should have more power than a government, because it makes decisions and decides if a law is constitutional on the basis of, one, the constitutional judicial precedent, not only in the given country, but in other countries as well. Thank you for your listening. So, that is the way, the process by which one overcomes the nation state, even after it has been established, you know, on behalf of the Palestinian people. What time do we have now? How much? 11, 35. Wow. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming.